Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Will. And uh, thank you all for, for being here. Thanks for the organizers uh, for giving me the chance to present this work that actually came out of a long collaboration over more than 10 years now uh, with quite a few people, as you can see uh, on the slide. And uh, I, I think there are one or two main messages, uh, if you don't remember anything else. Uh, the first one is, um, Everything about uh, this this package, color space I'm presenting, is also um, on on the web page, um, and you can look at that. It has much more materials. You can explore that, uh, and I encourage you to do so if you're interested in it. And the other message is maybe after all you don't need the package, but I'll say something about that at the very end, even though if you're interested in the palettes we're producing. So uh, to to get us. Uh, uh, right into the, the topic, why uh, are we working on this? And the reason is uh, graphics uh, like this one we're seeing here. Um, this is um, a risk map uh, about uh, the risk of influenza in, in Germany uh, that appeared uh, earlier this year, was widely circulated in, in Germany, in newspapers, national news, um, television news, <coughs> and so on. And um, if you look at this map, then the first thing you notice, there's a lot of color. It's very flashy, and um, at least to me, it's never that clear where to look at first, uh, which areas stand out most. And you would expect it's the areas where there's a lot of risk for influenza. But um, um, it's not so clear. So, so maybe it would be the, the bluish areas. You might be drawn to these red areas. But you really have to look uh, at the scale here on the right, which is in German. I apologize for that. That's the original uh, source from Robert Koch Institute. And so blue is a normal level. And then we go over green, moderately increased, over yellow to red, severely increased uh, influenza level. And so um, this, um, it's a, even for people with full color vision, there's a problem of spotting the areas of most interest. But uh, if you have dichromatic vision, so certain forms of color blindness, um, then the map might look something close to this. So here I emulated a deuteronome uh, vision, and uh, you see that you essentially can only distinguish um, the, the areas, uh, the high and the low areas. And those that pop out more are, are probably the ones uh, that are least interesting, the low risk areas. Or if you print this out on a grayscale printer, it will look something like this. Again, what stands out most is least interesting. So to overcome that, you, you can use better color palettes. And we are not the first ones uh, doing this. So you might know about uh, Color Brewer, Verides, and so on. Um, so here we, we constructed a palette with our tools. And I'll say something about the other packages later on. So, if you compare these, ours is a bit less flashy. And more importantly, uh, we start at a light um, yellowish area and go to a dark purple. Um, and uh, this is with increasing risk. And what stands out most now are the dark purple areas, uh, which we should be interested in, because at this time, there was uh, influenza in a lot of places in Germany. So what about um, color vision deficiencies? So this is, again, deuteronome vision. So these two do not look that different. A bit, but uh, it works. Printing out on a grayscale printer also works. So um, we, we have overcome uh, this, uh, this problem. So um, what we wanted to provide in, in color space was a principled way to construct palettes like this. Uh, with better um, properties where we have full control about what we want to do with the palette, to assess the palette and manipulate uh, existing colors. So that uh, we, we wouldn't do something like this if we were Bob Ross, right? <laughs> So why is the package called Color Space? Um, at the time Ross Ihaka started the package, um, there weren't um, that many implementations of color space conversions between different representations of color. Um, so this was the first one available, uh, that flexible one available in R. Meanwhile, GIA devices in base R also has some tools and um, there are also some other packages um, that, that do these things. 
Um, what I will be using uh, here in this presentation mostly is a, a conversion from a color space that's also known as HCL um, to uh, RGB, which is used for representing colors in R as in most other uh, computer systems. So otherwise, we won't be concerned with color spaces here. But that's where the name comes from. So this HDL space, um, HDL stands for U, Chroma, and Luminance, um, is um, a representation of color that's very intuitive for us as humans. So it represents color by three coordinates, the U, the type of the color, going from red over yellow, green, blue, purple back to red. Then we have Chroma, the colorfulness compared to a uh, gray, and then Luminance um, uh, being light or dark. And this gives us a natural way to talk about uh, color, one the dark red, uh, light blue, and so on. And in contrast, RGB, what is used for storing uh, colors um, uh, on, in many computer systems, is motivated by how uh, screens used to generate colors. So when we, we still had uh, um, guns uh, shooting uh, green and red um, and blue light at the screen, creating a certain color sensation, this controlled the intensity of these guns. And this is good for representing color, but not so intuitive for us to talk about color. Nevertheless, RGB is still being quite widely used, or simple transformations of it, like HSV or HLS, that some of you may or may not use, um, and it often leads to suboptimal color choice. So here I'm showing um, a color wheel, um, and in, in here in the middle, uh, there's uh, the, the color wheel um, um, projected onto a line going from red over yellow, green, blue, purple back to red. And uh, in, in the bottom panel, there are the corresponding HCL coordinates. The, the red line is um, the U, and we see that changes over the colors, whereas the other two coordinates, uh, the chroma and the luminance, are just fixed. So if you would print this out on a grayscale printer, it will all look the same gray. And uh, if you look at the corresponding RGB coordinates, you see them going up and down over this color wheel, but in a rather... Um, a non-linear way that would be hard to describe for us. Um, so it's easier to describe it in this color space. If we contrast this with um, the usual fully saturated RGB rainbow, um, then um, it has a very simple structure in the RGB coordinates. One coordinate going up, the other one going down, and so on. Also going you, giving you a color wheel going from red over yellow, green, blue, purple to red. But these are very, very unbalanced colors. And you see that if you look at the uh, U and chroma uh, and luminance coordinates. So the U's are um, clustered around the primaries, around red, green, and blue, whereas yellow and uh, purple are a little bit uh, narrower on the wheel. And uh, the, the luminance varies wildly. Yellow is very light, blue is very dark, and so on. And so, um, with, with, with this vocabulary, it's hard to come up with good palettes, and with this one here, it's easier. So what, what can we do to, to construct palettes with this uh, vocabulary? We distinguish three kinds of palettes, typically qualitative, sequential, and diverging. And the main point to understand about them is uh, their luminous property. So uh, the qualitative palettes are often constructed by being equiluminant, as I showed you on the slide before, balanced towards exactly the same gray. Um, sequential palettes go from dark to light or light to dark, um, as this grayscale does, but you can also add some, some chroma and a certain hue to it. Or you can do the diverging thing and go to two different uh, hues uh, that are preferably balanced between the two arms of the palette. And so the, the package um, provides uh, functions that implement these three kind of construction principles, qualitative HCL, sequential HCL, and diverging HCL. And you can tweak the, the coordinates um, uh, through which you want to go with your, um, uh, with your color palette. So to, to illustrate what, what this looks like, um, I'm taking a, a blue sequential palette here, uh, actually three different flavors of it. And um, 
And the, the first palette is a relatively simple one. The U is fixed, so this is the horizontal red line here. Um, the chroma goes down from colorful to not very colorful, and the luminance goes up from dark to light. And this is already quite useful if you want to distinguish extreme colors. So the light gray from the dark blue, you can tell that apart very easily. And so if it's just about bringing out certain pieces of extreme information in the map, let's say, uh, this is already a very useful um, uh, color palette. If you also want to distinguish information in the middle better, then uh, it's more useful to do something like this. So it's very similar to the one before, but here we use a triangular uh, chroma trajectory. And uh, this uh, makes it easier to distinguish uh, the, the colors that are here in the middle. And to tweak this a little bit further, we can also modify the U, change the U as we go along through the palette. And if we then want to construct a sequential palette, we can do either this thing with a monotonic chroma sequence or a triangular chroma sequence. And, um, um, and then just use two different U's that are preferably balanced between the two arms of the palette. And Using these principles, uh, we've created a wide range of palettes, uh, closely approximating many well-known palettes from our color brewer, from Carter colors, uh, Viridis, um, and so on. And um, we have uh, the functionality to pl easily plug them into base graphics, just by using the functions I showed you before. And we also have ggplot2 color scales so that you can plug them easily in base graphics or in ggplot2 graphics. We have some accompanying functions that help us with the visualizations. We have these functions that create the color swatches I showed you, the HCL spectra I showed you. We also have two-dimensional projections of this HCL space, which can help us understand what the palette does. And we have also a set of standard uh, demo plots, uh, certain kind of data visualization statistical graphics with which you can help assess how a certain palette works in a certain context. We have tools for um, emulating color vision deficiencies, as I showed you before. Um, and yeah, then we, we did this approximation of color palettes from other packages. And here I show you a palette going from light yellow to uh, dark blue as implemented in Color Brewer and our approximation of it. Or we could do something like Viridis, which is a bit peculiar in that it goes from light to dark, but the light colors are very, very uh, high chroma. So we, we have a very uh, high chroma yellow. In certain contexts, this works well. In other contexts, um, uh, this is more useful. If you want to bring out risk areas, uh, as in the first map I showed, this is more useful than Viridis. If you want to play around uh, with, with these things, um, uh, first, uh, in an interactive way, we have some uh, shiny apps, uh, some also done in TickleTK, uh, if you want to run it in your own machine. We have a website where you can look at our palette constructor, uh, a color picker, and also um, um, a color vision deficiency emulator. Okay, and then I come to my second point from the beginning. Um, so after we had done all this, uh, I could convince my uh, R core co-authors that it would be a good idea to at least have these fixed palettes that we uh, implemented in our package uh, also in base R. So this came out earlier this year and there's in GR devices, there's this HCL colors function. And um, it only has the fixed palettes, so you cannot tweak these. Um, so if you want that, you need to go to color space. But if you just want a palette, let's say Viridis, it's now in base R. So maybe this slide should have been titled, why you maybe don't need our package after all. So to conclude, um, I hope I have convinced you that, um, oh, you, you should put some thought into which colors you, should, you choose for which purpose. We have some guidance uh, in our uh, web page to, to help you with this. And uh, well, we, uh, the, the tools are there. For those who like reading papers, there's also an archive paper wrapping this up. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh... <laughs>
Thank you very much, Achim. That was wonderful. So do we have any questions? Yes. I'm closer. I'll just do this. Yeah. Thank you for your great talk. Um, where does the uh, alpha transparency uh, here in all your palette, and how does it uh, in the vector space between the H, E, and L, uh, where is the alpha? Um, the, the, the alpha for uh, transparency is orthogonal to all of this. So you can put an alpha uh, onto your palette if you want to um, or, or not. So the, um, the other functions have an alpha argument that by default, by default is at opaque colors. So it's a new dimension? Yes. Okay. okay. Other questions? Uh, sorry, you, you have to speak to a microphone, otherwise you, Here, you won't be recorded repeat. and nobody will hear your question. I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. sorry, one you Thank you, that was a good talk. Uh, does this translate well to printing posters? Like for CMYK, like when the printer uses it? Um, yes, uh, it, it depends um, uh, on... Um, on, on the palettes to, to some degree, but uh, all of these palettes are a lot more robust uh, to different printers, also different projectors than these fully saturated uh, colors. But if you want better guidance on that, you can also look at the, the Color Brewer webpage that di ex tested this more extensively. So we didn't do any testing uh, of ourselves, so it's just anecdotal ed evidence I can provide here. Okay, maybe one more quick, yeah. Just a quick question. For those of us from the corporate world um, that are often set with a corporate design and in the worst case this corporate design is red and uh, uh, green, um, what would you um, like, what kind of advice would you give us to, or is, is there a way to, to adapt maybe the color space to, to uh, kind of tweak the corporate design or something like that? Very good question. Thank you. So if, if you have certain colors you would you want to have in your palette, you, you can try that. So you, you can, um, for, for example, if you set up a diverging palette, that, uh, that can work. Of course, if your data isn't diverging, but sequential, yeah. So I, I would recommend to, um, to, to go to the, the app. Um, and uh, select the, the corporate color as an endpoint of your, your palette and uh, then see how you can work it from there.